part two of my interview with Mona Penton. So the last thing we talked about on the recording was fishing and how integral that is, the port of grave and whatnot. So I guess that brings us to talking about this place, the Fisherman's Museum. Um, and I would say it's almost a monument to the lives and to the work of people in Hibbs Hole and Porta Grave as a whole. I know you said this to me off camera, but for the sake of people listening, um, I've had a number of people say that you were with the museum board since the beginning. So what exactly does that mean? Well, there was an American artist came to the community in about 1966. Okay. And he would uh, paint and have a showing of his paintings. And, and then children got interested and he established an art school and somewhere he somehow he provided the children with a box of paints and a palette and whatever goes in an artist's case. Mm. And uh, I didn't know him very well. And then he, uh, one day, he asked me if I would go on a, a board. Mm. No, I'm wait now, I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> he used the little school up there for displaying his paintings. One man brought in a cannonball. All that was dug out of some cliff somewhere. And then some, another gentleman saw it and said, well, I've got something old too. <laughs> so they brought that to the, uh, uh, to the school and George put it on display. And gradually he built up a, a little museum in around his art show. <laughs> And then one day he asked me if I'd go on to be part of a board to get a, a museum built and established. So that was in 1969. And uh, there were five of us. And it was man Lewis Tucker. And there was George Dahl. And myself. And a Kennedy, but I forget which Kennedy it was. Anyway, we met in a stage. You know what a stage <laughs> yeah. is? A uh, stage. Like a fishing knows stage. What a stage yeah, is. yeah. Uh, Kennedy stage, uh, and talked. You know, he explained his vision to other people who were there. So from that time, then in 1970, we were incorporated. And then he got some money. I think Joey Smallwood might have been generous. Nice. And so he got enough money to build this museum, two local carpenters, and gradually the things that had been brought in from the, to the school uh, was transferred to the building, and other things added over the years, many things. So it was very successful. There was one year together with the children's showing of their paintings and George Nosworthy's and some of the other, like Jay Kennedy painted with them and Gary Kennedy was only a little boy then. Mm -hmm. He was only six about that. Aww. And David Mugford, he's uh, since passed away. And um, Anyway, uh, there was one year I started to say that there were 10,000 people on um, one week passed through here. It was amazing, you yeah. know, it was really, it was the place to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a real tourist destination to see the, the paintings yeah. and to see the museum. The porterhouse was added later, it was the choir. Um, so since the heritage side have took over now, it seems to it seems to have improved somewhat. And hopefully, it will continue to improve. Yes. Yeah. So you were a board member for many years. I was. Yeah. Quote since the beginning. Uh, you mentioned me, almost three decades. I would say. I would say it was. Uh, and you mentioned the names of the people who were on the founding board with you, uh, but I reckon you probably worked with a lot of people 
Do you remember anyone in particular that you worked with that you liked working with or that you felt really helped forward George Noseworthy's vision? It seemed like when George went out of the picture, that's the same vision. And I, I should add too that George, part of George's vision was to recreate the cove, the Hibs, Hibs Hole, or Hibs Cove, Hibs Hole is the traditional name, to recreate it as the old fishery and the old type of fishing, salting your fish in the stages. And, yeah. And uh, contrast that with the new harbour. Yeah. But now that wasn't there then, of course, but right. but he wanted to, you know, maintain the wharf and the stages down here yeah. as it was 100 or 200 years ago. But even how it is now, I think maybe accidentally it's almost helped him in his vision because nobody really upkeeps anything but... At the same time, it's a really stark contrast from like Hibbs Hole right here, and the har- and the harbor now. Yes. Very stark contrast, mm-hmm. right? A lot of people, like tourists, I'll say, tell me that they stop after uh, Ship Cove Pond because they don't think there's anything past it, and then they say they're like very surprised when they come down and it's like the old slipway and like the museum here, and yeah. you know, because they don't ex- they don't expect it. That's right. So I was saying to you earlier, I've worked at the museum for two years now, we'll say two summers. Um, and I did begin cleaning up, say, the little cubby holes under the stairs and the schoolhouse over there, trying to organize it a bit. Um, and while I was cleaning, I came across a lot of documents, a lot of letters, a lot of catalogs, a lot of bank statements um, with your signature on them. Uh, you seem to have kept record of everything that came in and went out of this place. Um, what exactly was your role as a board member for those 30 years? Like, what did you do for this museum, I'll say? Well, I uh, paid the students and we hired them on a, a draw basis. We didn't draw, hire on qualifications yeah. because it was pretty well local people. and. How do you, when you've got four jobs and ten people looking for them, how do you decide when it's so local? Yeah. I'm not sure if I, if we were, if I was secretary treasurer or just secretary. Maybe it was combined. That's a big role then. Yes. What was it like? Like, what was the positives, the negatives of working as a board member? and trying to get traction to this place and get people interested, like? I would say that's where we fell down during the lean years, I would say. We didn't do enough advertising and neither is it advertised well enough now. I mean, you can tell by the number of people you've had this summer. They've yeah. been pretty sparse, haven't they? They have, they have. Mm-hmm. Last year, I was told we had, last year we had 385. And I was told that that was one in recent years, was one of the highest numbers they've had. Yeah. Advertising was, you know, needed to be advertised on, provin- you know, in the provincial literature and yeah. brochures and whatever. Absolutely. And of course, that was up to to us to get that going. Mm. And maybe we fell down there. Oh. But hey, you work with what you got, money-wise, time-wise, yeah. contacts-wise, right? Different, uh, different governments as they, you know, had different priorities when it came to museums and grants and... That's true too. Yeah. Yeah. As we've said, this year marks the 50th anniversary of this building, at least, uh, the Fisherman's Museum. You talked about Noseworthy having this vision, right? Um, So what was 
this vision and what was the objective that the muse you on the museum board the other members and george knows we had for this place going into the future well my uh i can only speak myself personally really that i wanted to preserve for future generations to know where they came from and why things are like they are sometimes yeah and I think uh, George knows that he may be it as a tourist attraction. You want to make it, or you want it, and I suppose you still want it to be like this uh, house of, of heritage, almost, yeah. and history for the people around. What do you say you want, you wanted to accomplish by having the museum here? Did you want it to reach out to community, like the community, and have like young people come in, and like learn about where they came from? Is that? Well, there, were, for a number of years, we would have uh, school groups. They would come in as part of their, um, a part of their social studies, and hmm. maybe I, I would come out generally after I retired. I would uh, be because I just live across the road there. I would come out and uh, give them a tour. Of, uh, I remember they loved the old school. Yeah. And, and uh, certain things took appeal to different ones. Yeah. Certain sections. Mm. Do you think the museum and the porterhouse and the school and how it's presented has, has fallen short in accomplishing say what you wanted to accomplish, like the outreach to the community and to the younger people? Oh yes, big time. And it was because lack of interest. And I go back to Herman Porter again. He was doing the best he could. He kept it alive. He didn't have the time to devote to it that he could have. And yeah. I think we were trying to rest on our laurels. <laughs> oh. okay past years yeah you know what i'm saying i understand yeah it's we thought you only had to open the door and it would work it would work people would come yes. yeah and and i th i think too um with the heritage society especially with jennifer on board now the, i think the big thing she's trying to push especially is like online presence because everybody is online especially the younger people yeah um, so hopefully, or I'm hoping that that's going to generate more interest. Yeah. I have had a couple of people come and be like, I saw you on Facebook. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, and I think COVID-19 really throws a wrench oh, in other people time. coming, right? But what do you hope it offers to people not from Portograve and maybe not even from Newfoundland? I know once again, COVID, but in the next few years, what do you hope? other people from maybe Canada, maybe the world, can take away from this museum? I guess a, an appreciation for our way of life as it was. Their, their money to <laughs> help us maintain it. Mm. There was a period of time when we would have 16 or 17 tour buses come. Wow. And they would tour the museum. That's fantastic. Yeah, and the, and the porterhouse, and they they kept coming back until they saw that it had deteriorated. It would be nice if that could happen again. I think a place like this, other museums anywhere, any small or big museums in Newfoundland, and you may disagree with me, but I think they can offer people from outside the province new perspective. I, th I find people who come here often have like a really cutesy view of Newfoundland. Like, we're sweet little Newfoundlanders, we're friendly to everyone, and you know, we live in these colorful houses, yeah. and we have like clotheslines with the linen sheets blowing in the wind, but like, life was hard. And I think this gives people a perspective on that, that you know, we do, we're people, we did what we could, and here we are today. Yeah. I think you would agree with me then that the history of places like this and, and its peoples are important, not just to the people themselves, like you and I, from Newfoundland and with connection to the place, but to anyone, to everyone. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you knew George Noseworthy, not the best, 
Um, oh yeah, I know. I know we worked. You were close. Well. We worked yeah. together. Um, what was your opinion of him? Just like humble personal opinion, as friend or otherwise. Well, well I think he was genuine. He he wanted. He seemed to like to spread his knowledge of art to the children yeah. who were interested in watching him paint. And uh, his heart and soul was in this place. Then he had to make a living. He couldn't devote his all, all his life to running this place. <laughs> he needed to make a living. Yeah. He also established a music school. Yes. Here, and and uh, to be a very sincere and humble person. That's that good. Fell in love with him, soul and <laughs> people and Newfoundland. I know probably there might have been, he might have been wanting a venue for the promotion of his art. Or, you know, yeah. we all need a, some reason for doing. Yeah. That's my opinion of him. Yeah. yeah. You and other people say that he, he moved here because he was enchanted by the landscape, by the people, and you believe that to be true, as a lot of other people who I've talked to believe that to be true. And I think that's wonderful. We often take this place for granted, like Newfoundland as a whole. Um, we were born and raised here, um, and especially if we had a hard life, say, growing up, especially older generations, like perhaps even yourself, stuff got hard, your father had the shop around for work, you know, he never had a stable job, that could be hard sometimes. So I think often, because we're always here, we take it for granted, and I believe people like him, usually people from away, coming in and saying, this place is beautiful, it makes us stop and be like, wow, wait, this place is beautiful. Yeah, I, I can relate to that, I can remember being here, uh, with people from outside the province mm. and they would look across over there at all those cliffs and they would say, why aren't those cliffs beautiful? That seems so far out to me. Yeah. Cliffs beautiful? I mean, my idea of beautiful was rolling grass and a river running through and trees and whatever. Yeah. But after, you know, thinking about what they said, you know, now I, I think those cliffs are beautiful too. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It, it gives you new perspective. So their, yeah, their opinion influenced mine. <laughs> and I think that's one of the, the wonderful things about working in a place like this. You get people, even if you don't get a lot of people in a year, but you, like last year I had pe a man come in from Spain and you, th you think of Spain, or I think of Spain, I'm like, wow, what a beautiful place. But he said he loved looking out at the water, and he said that the ships go zigging in and out from each other was, he said, was such like a dance. I remember that. He described it as like a dance of mm -hmm. ships. But mm -hmm. you never look at it like that. You're no. just like, oh, that's whoever got under the boat. Even whales. We've only come to appreciate whales uh, in the last few years. Yeah. <laughs> We never thought anything about uh, whales coming in the bay after mm. the Cape Lynn or... Yeah, it's just something that happened, but mm. people will travel here to like take pictures, like icebergs. Yes. People love icebergs. Yeah. yeah. But for, for us, usually they're just clumps of ice floating well, down the Well, they were a nuisance to fishermen. Right. <laughs> the complete opposite of what yes. they're seeing now. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. They still are because they can get tangled in crab net pots and yeah. nets and whatever when they... I guess we'll finish with this. Okay. If you came from away, like George knows where they did, like any of the tourists from all over the world did, what would cause you to stay here in Hibbs Hole in, Port of in Newfoundland? Oh my, it's, it's peaceful. Yeah, yeah, so I it's... mean, I love it here. Yeah. But if I wasn't from here, what would entice me to stay? I don't know. Yeah. And honestly, I'd, it's, it's kind of like answering, why do you love it here so much? I mean, you'd say the people, the places it is, it's peaceful. 
spots. Well, then, no matter where you go, you get rude people, kind people, selfish people, uh, you know, you helpful people. You get yeah. it all times yeah. in any uh, in any place. So that when they are saying that, then people say that Newfoundlanders are helpful. And <laughs> I say to myself, people are people everywhere, and there's a a proportion of all kinds mixed in. True that. Mm. It takes all kinds to run the world. Yes. As they say. This is the end of the interview with okay. Mona Penton. Uh, thank you. This has been really lovely. Don't even worry about not, you know, being afraid of not good answers. You know, any answer is valuable. Even if you just had to sit there and not really say anything, that's valuable. At least to me. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you anyway, whether or not I gave the 